Roots of the Science podcast with your girl and with an E. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Root of the Suns podcast with your girl and with an E. A special reminder, as always, that if you want to start your own podcast, there's a link in the show notes that will direct you to the Buzzsprout site that I currently use and I continuously plug. So definitely check that out because you can also support this show. My guest today is Aviwe Matiwana from Eastern Cape in South Africa. She's a paleobotanist based at the Albany Museum. In this episode, we learn that she is a dog mommy and is her grandparents' child. Due to this, this played a crucial role in her love and her knowledge for plants. Avuya got into paleontology after volunteering at the Albany Museum. Currently, she is a PhD student at Rhodes University in South Africa. Her work involves finding the best descriptive features to identify and name Glossopaterius. Now, Avuya will give us some more context by telling us what this is and the importance of the work. Aviwe is also an avid nature enthusiast and a science communicator. In fact, she is known as a plant detective and runs a Fossil Friday campaign on Twitter. Aviwe tells us more about this and explains how this concept gets together. We also find out a very interesting fact from her that in South Africa, there's only three paleobotanists in the country. And she talks them, she talks more about the importance of scientific researchers sharing their research to get people more aware of of the opportunities available for them. Lastly, we discuss candidly about some general challenges faced by postgraduate students, in particular, black postgraduate students. Tune in to hear about all of this and so much more. Let's go. Hi, everywhere. Welcome to the show. Hi, Anne. How are you doing? I'm good. I am so excited to have you here. Like, you know, we have forced to be <laughs> It's been rough. Like, it's, everything just goes wrong whenever we have to have this uh, this chat together. But at least yeah. today, you know, we know it's going to work. We know, we know. Like, I think yeah. people don't understand how, like, we've it's been so- trying... Oh, it's been so frustrating. Either the electricity goes off or there's something it's that happens work. to me or there's something happens to you. It's just like work. It's It was, ah, we, we've been through the most. Let's just say that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so excited to be here. <laughs> I'm excited to have you. Like, you know, you you are like a powerhouse and it's an honor to have you on the show. Uh, <laughs> so before we get into that, please just introduce yourself for us. Tell us um, who you are, what you're doing, where you're currently based, etc. Okay. Uh, my name is Avwe Matuane, as you know. Uh, I'm from Aloha Nwaka in Mkandoli in the Eastern Cape. I am a paleobotanist. I have my MSc in botany from Rhodes University, and I'm currently registered um, for my PhD in uh, paleobotany, and I'm based at the Albany Museum. So I work with fossils. So paleobotany is the study of ancient life. So ancient plants. So um, that's what I do for a living. And also, I'm the mother to a lot of dogs and a goat. (laughs) (laughs) That's my life. I'm a I'm a granny I'm a granny's um my grandmother and my grandfather's child so I really love my grandparents my aunts are still around my mom's still around you know uh but I mean I have a close bond with my grandparents um so that's me oh man that's so lovely and it's beautiful that you have that beautiful relationship with your grandparents I know with some people um, due to locations or like you said, some of the grandparents um, passing away that they don't share that relationship. And I know, you know like, mm-hmm. there's a special power in like that relationship with your, with your grandparents. It's, 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 it's something special. So I love that you have that. 
Oh, it is. I mean, like, if you have both grandparents, uh, it's a blessing. You know, you need to treasure all of that. And uh, the bond between a grandparent and the grandchild is so amazing, you know. So uh, I've been blessed to actually have the best relationship um, with my with both of my grandparents. And um, so they've taught me a lot. And they've also molded me to be the person that I am today. Oh, that's amazing. So you mentioned you are a dog mommy and we can hear your your kids in the background. So let's just put it out there. <laughs> I'm really sorry about this. How many dogs do you have? Please just tell us because I'm scared I'll say the wrong number because I don't know if I can keep up. But I know you have a lot of dogs. I don't want the number I can't say out loud. <laughs> want to be judged by people but basically i have <laughs> i have a lot of dogs and yeah. um say about um out of okay i've got 10 plus dogs okay wow and uh out of all those dogs, I would say 10 are rescues and that I rescued. And then um, two of the, three of the, the dog, of the other dogs were actually adopted by my dog. My dog came with. So I thought, oh, you know what, it's okay. Um, the dogs uh, will probably find a way home. It's okay. Well, they stayed. It's <laughs> And, and the thing is, I didn't steal the dogs, you know. All yeah. I did was I literally went around um, the village asking, has anyone lost dogs? And no one, you know, responded. So I don't know where Bobby got the dogs from. So, um, and they were wonderful companions until he passed uh, two years ago as well. And he was my grandmother's favorite dog. Oh man, that's so yeah. beautiful. That's a wonderful, wonderful story. And um, so it seems like the central themes are your dogs and your grandparents. Um, and but just to bring work. it, <laughs> yes, just to bring it back to your work. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, how did Aviwe get into science? Like, what were some of those influences that actually got you into this? The, I want to say science as a whole and then specifically because I don't think a lot of people even know that paleobotany is a field of study so how did you actually end up there? You know, I, I always tell the same story over and over. And I've been thinking about um, the story that I always tell. And I find that there are a bit of loopholes to the story. So the story goes as um, I, when I was young, my grandfather used to take me uh, on walks uh, to the forest. And uh, he'd teach me all these medicinal plants growing up. So um, I'd know what plants are used for and stuff but I didn't know that there was actually um, a field called botany or I could study plants uh, in university and uh, what mm. happened was when I got to well, for my honors I got um, I wanted to do systematics I remember I applied for systematics and uh, my my then supervisor uh, contacted me and he gave me a bursary and said I should come to his lab so I ended up actually doing a project in forest biodiversity and um, I also uh, carried on with the project until I did my master's and then for my PhD I did paleobotany but in order for me to get to paleobotany I was um, volunteering at the Albany Museum and um, I met Dr. Rose Previk she introduced me to to fossils and plant fossils mm. and I got hooked from there so that's the the story but i i always some somehow forget to mention some of the core details you know about mm. how i actually got fascinated by science at a very young age as much as i was exposed to plants and everything i could see the healing yeah. power of plants 
to the things my um, my aunt used to do to help people because she's a Sangoma. So uh, there was also this mythical and medicinal side that I was mm. in practice, you know, that I was really fascinated with. And also coming from a rural village, you know, you always hear about yeah. people, um, witchcraft, you know, uh, things that are not explainable, you know, occurring. Mm. And... Uh, so that actually got me thinking and asking questions, you know, and I remember, I mean, I never mention my time when I was in Queenstown in high school. I'm always like skipping the story, but uh, this is also very important <laughs> because when I was doing yeah. <laughs> my, um, my high school in Queenstown Girls High, I remember mm. like I stayed in an area, my mom has a house in Queenstown called, um, I mean, in an area called Guatemba as Melin. So um, I used to stay in the last street of the neighborhood and the last street had a thicket across the road. So I used to play there and I used to go on adventures uh, into the thicket, you know, uh, looking oh, for plants, yeah. asking myself why it, it looks like this and in other areas it looks so different, you know. So um, that had some uh, decisions in me actually entering the science field and also i mean one of the stories that i don't tell is how um in high school i mean i was not okay i received i was a merit student i used to receive awards for my uh for my um grades and stuff i was one of the top students but i mean things changed um in high school um when i reached matric uh because i was sick and i struggled with a whole lot of things i was in hospital for most of the year and um so my grades actually dropped and I remember one of my high school teachers telling me that uh, science is not for me you know I'd never make it in science mm. I should consider another career this was not my science yeah. teacher it was um, another teacher I won't I won't name the teacher but it was <laughs> one of my teachers <laughs> in my um, you know in my uh, school and also what I found was um, even though there was a career guidance, uh, if you could not pay to see like the psychologist or to see the the counseling guides, then uh, you didn't know what it it is that you want uh, to do in yeah. you know in varsity. And unfortunately, my mom had the means to put me through the school, but she didn't have the means to to make everything accessible for me, you know, um, mm. in, the, in the terms of career guidance. So uh, it was mostly like most of the white kids uh, would um, get to know what their strengths were, what they do in varsity, you know, um, all those all those extra things I I didn't get. But I think um, I didn't lose out that much because, I mean, I'm here now and I uh, found my passion. Yeah, you're here now indeed. And I mean, let's just take it back to that teacher who said that you don't belong in science, like whoever yeah, that yeah. is. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure now you can be like, look at me I now, eh? Teach it, actually. <laughs> yeah, I want you to stick it and say hey look at me now you know and yeah. uh so i never ever thought i think that is one of the things that um as much as it affected me because i struggled in the first two years in undergrad you know i struggled mm. so much and um, because I didn't have the confidence in myself because I had been told that I wouldn't make it in what I wanted to do. So, yeah. um, and, and it hurt. I mean, I wanted to become a scientist, but at the same time, I wanted to become a veterinary scientist, like, you know, uh, uh, you know, and because of my love for animals, but mm. the f uh, being a vet didn't work because um, I'm a crybaby, you know, and... Um, <laughs> I don't like the emotionally blood. invested and, and all that stuff. Exactly. So what's the point? I wouldn't. Uh, I think I think I'd be the best doctor, but at the same time, I would not be the right doctor for emotional support of patients because I yeah. would be the one that needs the support, you know, afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I I'm 
knew then that uh, no, it's not going to work because my- so that's when that's when I decided that you know what, <laughs> I think the plant option is much better for me. <laughs> <laughs> indeed, indeed, um, and it's great that you you found your love in plants and you are thriving. So, you know, currently you are pursuing your PhD. So you're, in, you're at Rhodes University and yes, your I'm work amazing. involves, yeah. And your work involves finding the best descriptive features to identify and name. Oh, this one, the word is golos, golos. Glossopterous. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Called Gusotrus. This plant was actually uh, occurred, well, it occurred um, um, during uh, the Permian, which is 299 to 252 million years ago. So the plant got extinct after um, the Permian, like the end Permian extinction. It got wiped out. And then um, this plant was found in Gondwana. So Gondwana was a super continent that consisted of Africa, South America, yeah. Australia, Antarctica, and India. So uh, the plant uh, was found, so this fossil was actually found in all these continents, and I mean, all these um, land, land masses, and um, it helped to support the theory of uh, continental drift that all these land masses were once one. So it played a very huge and important uh, contribution to that. And uh, so it is a gymnosperm. And uh, so it used to, it um, it grew about, some people say it's a shrub, right? But uh, I mean, there's been a fossil wood from the sculptures that's been found. And it's estimated that it was about 35 meters high or three stories high. So yeah. it was like massive tree as well you know and um so at the moment i'm working on a site from the middle permian so not a lot is known about the middle permian in south africa but i'll get to that later but let's focus on chrysopterus so what's interesting about chrysopterus is that it formed our oldest coal deposits in south africa so um those uh so these plants are really important in our economy and um they actually supply our electricity. So just because um, they're not here anymore, they still have a huge impact that we see today and a huge contribution to our daily lives. So, yeah, that's that's about the plant. So, but glossopterus means a tongue-shaped fern, but it's in Greek. But it's not uh, a fern; it's a gymnos. It's a gymnosperm. So um, those are some of the things that I think are interesting about Chrysopteris that I have mentioned so far. Yeah, that's that's very interesting. Um, just for the people who aren't in plant sciences, um, explain what a gymnosperm is versus an angiosperm, because you keep on saying that it's a gymnosperm. Okay. So what does that mean to the other? <laughs> So, okay, so this is the time, uh, the Permian is the time before there were dinosaurs, okay? And uh, so before dinosaurs walked the, 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 the earth. And gymnosperms are different from angiosperms. The simplest way I can say is gymnosperms are not flowering plants. So the flowers that you see um, on, most, uh, on most trees are, I mean, um, on most plants are... Are angiosperms, whereas uh, gymnosperms did not have flowers. Yo, Aviwa, you just took me back to biology in the <laughs> first year <laughs> when I needed to know all of these things, or yeah. even in my undergrad classes when these are the things that you needed to know in like um, in plant science courses. So it's pretty yeah. exciting it's, for you. It, it like it gets applied um, later on. And also, yeah. um, I just wanted to touch on what you said that, you know, for people who say, why study the things that are, why are you so focused on this plant everywhere? Like, 
it, it happened so many years ago. But I like how you said that even though it's it happened all those years ago, even before the dinosaurs, it's still mm. important now because, um, you know, like you said, for the cold uh, deposits. And in yeah. South Africa, where we have load shedding, load shedding, mm. for those who don't know what that is, is when we have timed um, electricity cuts here in South Africa. Which and, was also uh, part of the reason the why reason. we couldn't actually have a <laughs> chat. Yeah, I was like, that is also another reason why we couldn't have our interviews, like, <laughs> yeah. because of all of those uh, load load shedding um, things. So that's so fascinating. And um, clearly you love what you do because, um, like... I know you have this really cool thing on your um, social media page where you call yourself um, the plant detective and um, you, you run a series um, called fossil Fridays um, on Fridays. Can you just tell us uh, why you did that and what that is all about? It was before black botanist week and it was blacks in nature. So that was uh, the um, the trend that was actually um, on Twitter. So what I did was I introduced myself as in Black in Nature, and um, so I was trying to find a, a word to describe what it is that I do, you know, and uh, with the taxonomy background. So um, it just came to me. I just said, oh, okay, then I'm a plant detective, you know. So uh, that yeah. was one of my posts, which went crazy, and viral. Um, so I think people, <laughs> and I think uh, people actually enjoyed that, and I got like a huge following. And then when Black mm. Botanist uh, Week arrived, I got more uh, more followers and stuff, and I decided to start a series called um i mean it's it happens on fridays which is fossil friday the series is called um keeping up with the plant detective so um love it. and that <laughs> <laughs> so in that series um it includes a lot of fossils so fossil plants not necessarily the ones that i'm working on uh the series at the moment is on uh, episode nine and um yeah it just came That's about fantastic. it was like it, it was nothing that i had planned um i remember when i made the post on that friday the very first episode yeah. i um i had something in mind of what i was gonna do it literally changed as i was going um we just do this every single friday so it's become a thing now and i've um I, I thoroughly enjoy it, particularly like um, teaching. Teaching is something that I'm very passionate about and I love. So if I can't explain something, then um, how can I expect my audience to actually mm. understand what it is that I am doing or what I'm interested in? So as the episodes go, I'll, I have a different um ideas about what I want to do and also it includes um, not just extinct plants, there will be a, a time when I actually talk about the research that I did in my masters and also yeah. tap into um, things like, I mean, simple things like you asked, what's the difference between a gymnosperm and an angiosperm? Or because plants are not um, that exciting to other people. They're not like dinosaurs or hominids that people actually love, you know. Um, yeah. They and get it's so to. Sad. You it know, is, like, you know. Plants have got such a bad rip. It's yeah. compared to the other things. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, it's it's okay. We're changing that. <laughs> And that's why you I mean, here, Twitter has introduced me to some phenomenal scientists, you know, plant scientists. And, and um, I must say, the research that is going on is amazing. And I am glad that some of them have actually stepped um, out of the shadows and into the light and started using social media to share their work because mm -hmm. we're getting botany out there. We're getting people uh, to see that there's more to the earth than just animals but there are also important plants they different fields in botany it's not just looking at you know fossils or just looking at 
angiosperms within that they different disciplines as well so and i love the fact that um social media is there and can be used as a weapon to actually further science to make it reach other people who cannot reach it in other like in other ways so sharing uh, your research is very important to make sure that it reaches the relevant people to make sure that you also know your work and to make sure that you get people into the field that you want i mean in south africa like uh, there are only three paleobotanists so well natasha left uh, she went overseas to do her postdoc so at the moment there are two um they two paleobotanists and it's my supervisor and her supervisor you know and then uh, once i'm done i will be the third uh, paleobotanist as well macro a uh, paleobotanist because uh, natasha is actually doing paleontology so um mm. it's it's yeah it's it's quite interesting and but i mean if you want research to progress you need more people in the field um I mean in the states you have labs of people filled with people you know researchers that are studying plants they studying different fossils you know and then here in South Africa you have two people and they can't do the all the work you know and yeah. I felt like it was very important to actually make sure that people are aware of our wonderful heritage you know we've got some mm-hmm. of the best fossils in the world and yeah. um I think in comparison i think australia in terms of our plant fossils is uh one of our you know competitors in terms of beautiful preservation and fossils but you know i'm biased south africa is the best anyway so <laughs> uh <laughs> So I'd really, really love to see more people get into the field, but at the same time, I want people to find their own paths, not necessarily um, get into a paleobotany, but to know what it is that they want to do and also have the opportunity to be exposed to a particular field and someone that mm. actually looks like them in that field. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah. You've, you've touched on so many golden nuggets, have you? Um, in particular, the ones that I loved is how you're saying that scientists now are coming into the light, using social media to put themselves out there. And yeah. like, like you said, that there's only two, and when you graduate, um, you'll be the third one. In the whole of South Africa, which is wild. Yeah. Wild. yeah. And, and probably um, the whole of Africa, hey, I, may be ro- I might be wrong, but I mean... Uh, I haven't uh, heard of anyone else that is um, that is a paleobotanist, macro yeah. paleo- paleobotanist in Africa, except for the people I have mentioned. And even when there is like research that needs to be done in other places in the continent, it's always these um, few people, these handful of people that are actually um, contacted to actually go and collaborate with um, with other the researchers to do the work on fossil plants wow so there's obviously a huge gap and just for, somebody, <laughs> just for somebody who's now interested you know who didn't know what this is somebody who's young getting started into stem what are some opportunities that you being in your field has allowed like which doors have been opened or where which spaces have you gotten into um because of being in this niche field of yours i think the one thing is you can't um you can't compare people you know i think other people are more um introverts uh, i'd say i'm an introvert and an uh, and um what's the other one extrovert right extrovert and, yeah. yeah yes and i'm a combination of both i would say personally like if you know me you'd know um I, I laugh, I do a whole lot of things, but I really like my personal space and I like being by myself, you know. Um, but the problem is that I can't exactly say that um, what what worked for me will work for them because I, I was a go-getter, you know. Um, mm. I, 
you know, I, I I took every opportunity that was afforded to me. I mean, in order for me to actually get into science communi- uh, communication properly, I entered Fame Lab. Mm. Uh, I was part of the uh, top 10 national finalists. And it all stemmed from wow. there. I got my confidence from there. And, you know, I've been attending conferences, presenting, winning awards. So as I go, my confidence actually increases. And I don't normally wait for opportunity to come to me. I find opportunity, you know. I Mm. find ways Mm. to actually put myself out there. So, um... In if they in terms of funding in the in 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 paleo in paleo botany there's past mm. and uh, there's also the NRF and um, there's the DST and there's also the DST uh, NRF uh, Center of Excellence in uh, Paleo Sciences. So those mm. uh, bodies actually do fund the uh, paleo botany because it is a scarce skill you know and um so if you i mean there are only two places you can go to actually do paleo botany it's either vids or you come to roads and be with my supervisor so um <laughs> it's only those <laughs> those two places and luckily we have um you know a relationship with most of these uh, organizations so mm. the first step would be to secure funding and to make yourself be the better like the best scientist you can be is to actually make sure that you equip yourself and get yourself a good mentor you know uh, mm. get a mentor that um will help you navigate your way through this field i mean i was never um I didn't do paleo, uh, paleontology in any form, like any form of paleontology, except uh, when I did uh, a course in archaeology in undergrad, but uh, that had to do with diets and evolution of people. So, um, but that, I never, I didn't have a paleontological background. So you don't necessarily have to have a paleontological background to do a PhD, but it helps, you know, depending in which field you, you go to. I mean, you you have doctors who become paleontologists, you have um, people like botanists, zoologists, you know, anthropologists. Mm. So um, mm. it's, 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 a, it's an interdisciplinary field that um, anyone can get into if they actually are, you know, are interested in actually doing um, all of that. And also, I mean, you can go to UCT. UCT also has an excellent um Paleo, paleo sciences, um, de- like various paleo sciences departments there. Um, so mm. you can try and um, and go there. But the first thing you need to do is to find uh, a researcher that you want to work with and also uh, make sure that you secure funding because funding is very important you can't uh, survive your phd without funding yeah, you know? uh, yeah. so what are you going to eat where are you going to stay you know so make sure you secure uh, funding and make sure make this is very important make sure you investigate the advisor that you want mm-hmm. okay Mm-hmm. Make sure you know mm-hmm. about their background. Make sure you contact their past students. Make sure so, mm. so because a PhD is a is, is a commitment, you know, and you do not yeah. want to be depressed in a lab and not succeed in your field because of the toxic work environment, you know. So make mm. sure you do your investigation. And like I said, get a mentor who can actually help you navigate through your PhD as well because I've had a, a variety of people that actually help me and I mean I've got like some wonderful friends who are in my corner always cheering me on you know and we support mm. each other through everything because it's not easy being a postgraduate student regard a student regardless which field you're in you know so be you know enjoy enjoy the project choose a project that you enjoy because you're going to be stuck with it for quite some time yeah that's true you've said so many um like so much good advice especially about the mentor that is very important like even for me like like i think 
even before your project, like the person who's going to help you in that project is way more important. And of course, yeah. funding, funding is important if you can get it. Um, however you get it, that is also very important. And yeah, reaching out. I think that's also another thing that we don't, which I'm loving yeah. that this, this conversation is being openly discussed nowadays that yeah you know post-grad is not easy breezy beautiful it's not. You know, like you go through so much so i'm so glad that we get to have open discussions and you can relate you can talk to your friends and even the ones who look like oh my word she's doing so great she's being featured here 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 Meanwhile, this person exactly. is also going through some things. So it's exactly. so good that we we are able to have these conversations. And um, I love it when my guests bring this up because this should be a reoccurring message because uh, I, I hate to say it, but I think there's something wrong with the academic system as a whole in terms of how they look after the postgrad, mm-hmm. postgraduate student mentality. Definitely. So it is, it, I think I have, I'm yet to speak to a person who said that they went through postgrad and it was nice. I'm not saying it should be nice, but it's mm. just too much, too many horror stories um, and horror stories that have been, that you, you weren't even able to recognize that there were horror stories because the yeah. type of environment has been so normalized, like it's all right. So yeah. it's good that we have these conversations. Like these are the things as you're coming, the next generation of researchers, they should know about this. And we, as the people who are ahead, should be like, hey, I'm struggling too. You will struggle. Yeah. It's okay. You can talk to me. So I really love that you touched on all of those things. But also, you know, what I think is very important is the fact that uh, we also need to to understand that sometimes it's... I don't know how to put this. Um, let me just say that... We as black students, you know, particularly black students or students of mm. color, are, are at risk when it comes to um, to postgraduate, um, you know, studies and stuff. Uh, because uh, one of the things is we always get into projects that are already there. Not necessarily yeah. that we we are interested in that project but because of situations and you want to further your study you you decide okay i will take um i'll I'll take up this project you know in this lab i'm being offered this you know uh i I should be grateful this should you you know you you have that uh mentality but when you get there there's no support you're Mm. left on your own you don't know how to navigate things you know so um I think as much as it's hard to to just sit and wait for the right project or just or, or search for someone who um, who has the same interest as you, you might not know, you know, you might not know, but we tend to come with the first offer that comes that um, that comes around. And um, sometimes the money that's attached to the PhD yeah. or the postgraduate uh, BSc is a huge draw particularly when you come from an underprivileged background so uh, without actually realizing that as much as they want you there they don't want you there it's mostly for paper you know to say i do have black students but what are you as a researcher or a pi doing to actually support your black students in that field and why uh, why haven't you graduated a lot of of post of black uh, postgraduate students. I mean, this has most of the time uh, people will will say no. Uh, black students are lazy. No, there's no such thing. Mm. There really is no such thing. What what efforts have you made to actually um, to make sure that uh, the student uh, progresses and um, they they are well equipped in your lab doing the research in your lab why do you want the student to be the odd one out you know so um, 
sometimes um, these institutions need to take responsibility for the way they treat uh, black students in postgrad, you know, because most of the time we are getting into institutions that are historically white and there's, there, has, there haven't been a lot of black people, you know, in those institutions, in those labs, in different posts, you know. So you still have to uh, struggle with discrimination and you have a uh, lab dynamics with, uh, with students who do not see that you have potential, you know. So you have to work a lot. As much as you're facing a whole lot of things that come with being a postgrad, you still have to face mm. other things that uh, you have no control over. And the moment you speak up, speak up about it, it's like you're a troublemaker mm. and stuff. But all you're asking is for you to be treated the same. And how how is that a bad thing? And how is that like... Um, I don't understand why a lot of institutions do not um, address this issue because it affects a lot of students. It affects them so much, particularly black students. And then you see them dropping out and you, you see a mm. student dropping out, not necessarily that they don't have the potential, but no, they've been left on their own. There's no supervision. Um, they've just been given the bursary money. Here's a project, you know, and obviously as a, as, as a post, as, as a postgrad, you still have to have that independence of doing the research by yourself. But yeah. I mean, yeah. uh, you still need the guidance of your PI. I mean, some people, I mean, your supervisor or your advisor, whatever you call um, them, but um, it's it's it really is difficult. You can't be facing financial problems and mental problems, emotional problems, mm. and then you still have to worry about a whole lot of things and the dynamics in your lab of whether you are actually accepted or not. It's it's just not fair you know it's not yeah it's not and like i said there's there's a systematic issue and we can mm. discuss this i mean it's like you said in particular with yeah. um, students of color and yeah it's a long fight that it's unfortunate that we we have to <laughs> continue fighting it yeah and so many of us like i actually had a conversation with a friend who was saying that you know they didn't do the PhD because not saying that they didn't want to do a PhD, but it mm. wasn't, um, it was more of a matter of circumstance that, Hey, there's yeah. money here. Yeah. Hey, I yeah. need to do something because I have a family to support exactly. um, the job. And I, and, I, and I can't sit at home. As yeah. Well. I can't yeah. sit at home. And then all of these, uh, like you said, all of these emotional things, but mm -hmm. there's something that needs, I don't know what needs to be done, but it, maybe if you just continue speaking about it, eventually some, some way, somehow the, the, these things will be, will be rectified. And yeah, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful that you actually brought that up because so many people face that so many people understand it and it's mm. and it's difficult and it's difficult um, but I mean, and just it's, it's also difficult for the students themselves to actually say something particularly when they are in that uh, situation you get the few oddballs like or are you wear and your ands and <laughs> your you know your kims and nomas and cylindros mm. Who are loud, you know, and uh, and who talk about uh, discrimination in the workplace, discrimination in post grad, you know. But um, it's sometimes when you do something like that, um, it's 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 like I said, it, it seems like you're a stirrer, but it's really not about stirring. It's about saying, hey, stop being racist, you know. Mm. Hey, Simple. look at yourselves, you know. We yeah. want to be yeah. treated like human beings without being told to be thank thankful or grateful for the funding, you know. Um, this was not like... It, uh, I, <laughs> I, I felt that sigh. I felt that sigh. And just for the purpose of time, um, you know, we have to wrap this up. But I really no enjoyed this conversation um, with yeah. you. And 
Thank you so much, Anne, for having me. Um, I really enjoyed it. I mean, we didn't ta- talk too much about my work because I blab a lot and I giggle a lot, but <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm really grateful that you actually had me um, on your um, for this interview. And I had a lot of fun, you know, and uh, thank goodness it actually happened eventually. Yeah, I mean, this is what, this is what they try to shut down. Um, and here yeah. it is in its beauty. And- and yeah. also you're doing uh, some really good work you know um i'd also like to commend you on the work that you're doing exposing scientists you know to um like on social media what work they do uh, i mean your interviews have been phenomenal um and interesting so please keep up the good work and um yeah i i enjoy every episode you post Oh, thank you so much. Uh, I'm so glad that you're part of this now. You're part of the collection. Uh, (laughs) You're part of the collection of scientists. And once again, everybody else who's listening today, thank you so much for taking the time um, for tuning into another episode of the Root of the Science podcast with your girl and with an E. Goodbye.